Hey guys, it's uh, Jay Anthony. Welcome back to uh, my channel. We're going to do another installment of my uh, video vlog series. Uh, thanks for continuing to put up with me doing these crappy videos in convenient environments for me in terms of like driving in my car. Hope this doesn't bother you guys too much. Uh, two big questions for today's, uh, well I shouldn't say two, there's two questions but one big one. One is Grand Seiko, so I'll kind of give you my spin on Grand Seiko's. And the other one is going to be scratches on your watches. So uh, a couple things, I want to do kind of a prerequisite to all my videos. You know, I have a lot of experience with watches and I've seen a lot of things and been around a lot of things, but I am by no means the expert on anything and everything. And you know, this is what I know. I don't know everything and uh, feel free to chime in if you uh, have other opinions or had different experiences. And uh, I'd say Grand Seiko's is actually kind of a good intro for that as well because I've never personally had interaction with them in person. I, I know a lot about them. I've owned several Seikos. I've never owned a Grand Seiko. And so this is gonna be my take on what I know about them from an industry perspective and just my experience with them kind of as a by the way thing. So just now that I've gotten a lot of the way, I, I just wanna make sure to you, my audience, that my opinion is based on my experience and I approach everything from a place of logic and reason so I don't want to mislead people and I also want people to know that I make judgments based on facts. So just so you know what you're getting into, these aren't my opinions, these are what I know and they're subject to change based on further facts. So there we go. So first thing is Grand Seiko's. Uh, thank you for the individual that suggested Grand Seiko's for a vlog. Uh, Grand Seiko's are actually really interesting. So Grand Seiko, to my understanding, came about in about 1960. Um, to those of you that are wondering what Grand Seiko is, uh, Grand Seiko, in a lot of ways, is kind of like a, the Seiko equivalent of a Rolex, I guess is probably how I would classify it. Um, they don't have anywhere near the market penetration of uh, Swiss watches of that caliber like Rolex. In fact, Grand Seiko is distributed in very few markets, um, Japan being one of them. Where I live in the United States, unless something has changed that I'm not aware of, you can't walk into a jewelry shop and buy a Grand Seiko. And Grand Seiko was basically, the approach to Grand Seiko, the philosophy as it's been explained to me was, Grand Seiko was introduced as the simplest form of watch making um, in terms of what is gonna make the watch the highest, utmost quality without getting over the top on decoration and just a watch making in its purest form. Uh, you know, put simply using the highest quality of components and the simplest manufacture and design to the highest degree of finishing and quality create the greatest watch you can. And what I mean by that is completely pure minimalist in that approach. So their watches, while I think they're aesthetically quite pretty, um, they're not over the top with filigree and engravings and details. They're very much machines. And so if you're into like industrial design, you're probably really gonna like Grand Seiko's because they're just minimalist pieces. They're, they're works of art in the fact of their simplicity and their quality. But if you're somebody who's really into Geneva seal pieces, Pateks, Audemars, Vacherons, you're not gonna find, while well, they do a little bit of decoration, you're not gonna find their movements over the top with decoration and stuff for the sake of just decoration, period. They're pure watches, that's their essence. They don't claim to be anything other than they are. They're utilitarian watches, actually. I guess the best way that I would explain them is they have the same characteristics as the entry-level Seiko in terms of they have function and form. They're just the level of manufacturer has been taken up that extra several notches. So they have the highest quality materials, they have the highest quality finishing, and you're getting a piece that's just got incredible build quality and it's going to be very well regulated. You're getting accuracy and quality in a, in a simplistic package. And for someone like me, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, but these are not watches designed for this, the pure art form of watching. They're watches. They're, they're putting function, quality, and uh, performance ahead of uh, you know, just overall design. So again, this, this isn't a watch for a connoisseur that's really into detail for the sake of detail and you know, intricate design. These are not the watches for you. And actually, uh, Seiko has another brand in the house called Credor, which is probably something that'd be more of interest to those that are interested in just highly designed pieces. Grand Seikos are not highly designed pieces in terms of the physical design of aesthetics. I guess aesthetics is the best way I'd explain it. A Grand Seiko, again, is watch in its simplest form. What can we do to make the greatest quality watch in its purest essence of mechanism with the best materials and the best accuracy? That's what they're all about, and that's what you're going to get. And a lot of people, that's not really not what they're into in a lot of the Western markets. 
Um, you know, in the United States, for example, it's a tough sell for a lot of people to go spend several thousand dollars on a watch that says Seiko on the dial. Um, so their, their market isn't to the same people that buy watches for prestige. The buyer, from my mind, that buys a Grand Seiko is somebody who appreciates fine quality and simplicity and just the essence of a watch. Uh, they're not somebody that's overly concerned with what somebody's going to think about them or what it says about them on their wrist. And they're not really enamored with intricate aesthetic details and just carving and just design for the sake of design. So, you know, like, again, they've been around since about the 1960s. Uh, Grand Seiko, if any of the, if all the watch companies, I'd still put, I'd put them very much in the bucket of they're an engineering first, design second kind of thing. And one of the movements that they're, they're pretty famous for um, is a movement that's actually a combination of a quartz and a mechanical movement. And um, it's called the Seiko Spring Drive Movement. And if you have any interest in watchmaking and horology, uh, do yourself a favor and look it up if you're not familiar. I personally... It doesn't speak to me because it has a circuit board. It uses a quartz mechanism in it to a degree. Um, but just from engineering wise, it's incredible. And basically what Seiko did with this watch, and it's available in a lot of Grand Seikos. Um, it's also available in Credors to my understanding and a couple other watches. Is they married the best aspects in their mind of a quartz movement and a mechanical movement. So basically what they do is you have a mechanical rotor and it winds. And as it winds, it dedicates some of its energy to powering a quartz crystal, to my understanding. And I'm not an engineer in neurology, so I may be getting this wrong. And then the quartz mechanism is actually the, the functional escapement of the movement. So in mechanical watches, you have an escapement, and that basically regulates the unwinding of the mainspring. And it's that escapement that basically sets the base of the watch and by a factor of the accuracy of the watch. Well, rather than having a mechanical escapement, this watch relies on a mechanical rotor and winding system, but it uses that um, to charge a, a quartz crystal, which is in turn used to actually regulate the movement. So unlike most mechanical movements or even most quartz movements, you actually get a continuous sweep. So mechanical movements, you have a smooth sweep to a degree, and depending on how many beats per hour they are, the sweep is smoother or more ragged. And quartz movements tend to click every second. Uh, Seiko Spring Drive, it's a total continuous sweep. It's a perfect sweep, and it's actually a really pretty thing to behold. So uh, that, to me, that movement is kind of, in a nutshell, the best way I can explain to someone what Grand Seiko is all about. They're all about perfecting the watchmaking, and they're breaking it down into its simplest form of function and design strictly to reinforce function and accuracy. So they're, again, very pure watches. Again, they're not for those that are really into their their decorations so I, I guess that's how I'd put Grand Seiko um, I'm sure people are gonna ask me what I buy one the answer is no um, and the reason isn't for what you would think I really like them and actually I, I think I'd be a great buyer for one the reason that I wouldn't buy one is twofold and they both relate to the fact that I live in the United States so one is unfortunately and this goes along with other watches that aren't available in the US and Seiko their Credor line is no exception to this is there is not a really good service program for Grand Seikos in the US and so and this is just my understanding of people that have owned them they have to be sent out overseas for repairs a lot and it's uh, difficult just to get them serviced in the US period the other thing that I've heard and you know there's someone in my comments sorry somebody just cut me off <laughs> if there's someone in my comments that knows more please feel free to tell me what you've heard uh, but my understanding is Grand Seiko doesn't make a habit of stockpiling parts and what I mean by that is you know, when you old older watches, and if you've watched my channel, I've owned a lot of vintage pieces. Older stuff is more likely to break, and sure enough, it does. And you have to rely on, you know, a used market to pick up pieces where you can use to repair your watches. The problem I've heard with Grand Seikos, um, you know, part of it is they have a lower volume for their watches because they're not in a lot of markets. And so with a lower volume, by default, you're going to have less spare parts. And the other thing I understand, and this is what I've been told, so feel free to fill me in if I've been wrong on my understanding, is that they don't stockpile parts for more than 10 years. That it's the, Se the Grand Seiko philosophy is that they will keep parts to keep watches running for about 10 years, and then after 10 years, they're not really concerned with stockpiling parts. And I've heard of several people buying vintage Grand Seikos from the 60s, which are beautiful pieces, and I still very much appreciate them, and I think a lot of people do. They're actually quite collectible, but they found that when things break, they're very difficult to get repaired. And so that's just something else to keep in mind. Um, and those of you that watch my channel know that I sold off a lot of my Swiss watches just because I got sick of the servicing hassle. 
and there's a lot of parts out there for Swiss watches but to, with the Grand Seiko if this really is the way the market is and it's that difficult to find used parts then I mean that's just that's a headache and I, I personally don't want to deal with that and the other problem is again I live in the United States and so I'm a, I'm a practical person um, you know I find no matter whatever my budget is at the end of the day I always look at my return on that investment and let me be clear I'm not saying watches are good investments don't take that at all but whenever I buy anything, I always anticipate what it'd be like to sell it if I decide to move on from it. And with Grand Seiko's, you know, there's a little bit of a community forum in the U.S., but unfortunately, a lot of the Swiss market, in my opinion, and feel free to disagree, is fueled by people that are stuck up to a little bit degree, and they're looking for things that give them status. I mean, they're, they're, for all the watch guys like us, there's plenty of snobs that know nothing about watches, that buy watches based on the name printed on the dial. And unfortunately... In my experience, and again, feel free to tell me your thoughts, they represent a large portion of the watch market, and you need people like that to fuel the watch market. And so, because the watch says Seiko on the dial, you're not gonna be catering to those individuals that are status focused. If they're gonna go spend 3,000 plus dollars on a watch, odds are they're gonna be more interested in a watch that says Rolex or Omega or Breitling or something else than a watch that says Seiko because you can spend $200 on a Seiko just as easily as you can spend three grand on a Seiko. You're not getting that prestige with it. So it's gonna be a very tough sell for individuals like that. And of course that means that on the resale market, it's gonna be, it's, it's tough to unload a grand Seiko in a market like the United States. And so again, those are the two reasons why I personally wouldn't consider one. If I lived in Japan, I'd have a grand Seiko in a heartbeat. Because um, there you wouldn't be worried about the serviceability issues and there you wouldn't be worried about, you know, the resale value because in my understanding of Japanese culture, and I'm not an expert by any means, is that while there's obviously every country has its own group of people that are concerned with status, the Grand Seiko has a very comfortable market there and has a very good sense of value and there isn't, isn't so susceptible to people being adamant about the name on the dial. So I think it'd be easier to sell into a market like Japan and I think there'd be a better serviceability for it in a market like Japan. So I love them. If I lived in any other place where they were better supported, I would own one. You know, and it's part of the reason why I wear Seikos today. I mean, I'm wearing my Monster for this video and it's part of the reason why I sold a lot of my Swiss watches. I think Seiko makes incredible products. Um, and you know, the reason that I'm wearing a Monster right now instead of a Grand Seiko is because I'm not worried about the resale value on my Monster and I'm not worried about the serviceability on my Monster it's for a couple hundred dollars it's not a big risk if i was going to go spend you know multiple thousands of dollars on a grand seiko that's a bigger risk and that's just not for me but wonderful watches i really hope to have some one-on-one -on -one experience with some of them in my lifetime uh, credor is something else you guys should look into anybody with interest in grand seiko take a look at credor as well those are really cool watches and unlike grand seiko those have more design to them those are definitely a much more of a design aesthetic to them and uh, again you owe it to yourself to look at them Obviously, my bias is very much towards Japanese watches. If you've watched my channel, I've very much kind of gone down that path. And it's it's funny. I mean, I, I tend to take everything on my car channels back to a car analogy. I mean, like, I look at the... I mean, the car I'm driving right now couldn't be a better analogy for this video. Right now, I'm driving my Lexus LS. The Lexus LS was a Japanese answer to unreliable German cars at the time. German cars that had poor serviceability and unreliable cars. And Toyota was smart about it at the time, and they gave it a different name, and they gave it time to build up some prestige. But if this car in the United States was sold as a, a Toyota LS instead of a Lexus LS, it'd be the same situation as a Grand Seiko. It wouldn't matter how reliable or how accurate it was. <laughs> in the case of the watches, um, it wouldn't cater to that prestige market. So I think, you know, if Seiko decided to start really pushing their Creedor band and built up some of that prestige behind it, I think like you know Toyota did with Lexus, I think they really could have quite a following in the US, but I think that's kind of what's holding them back. So, you know, I, I've owned several German cars, I've owned several Swiss watches, my biases have pushed me out to the Japanese market, although I, I like American stuff too, but that's a whole other point. I'm getting off topic, but point being is, uh, Japan makes some awesome stuff. Uh, you need to decide what's right for you. Um, you know, and uh, those are my, my concerns of Grand Seiko. If you're looking to pick one up outside of Japan or their big support markets is be aware of service, be aware of parts availability, and be aware of your resale. And if you're comfortable with that, I couldn't recommend them enough. They're wonderful watches. And the other question that I got asked, <clears throat> and to be honest, I'm really not heard, I'm sure how to address it, is uh, getting scratches on your watches. Uh, someone brought up on my channel that, you know, they're, they're always concerned about getting scratches on their watches and how do they worry about, how do they deal with that? And 
you know, the reality is, is hopefully, I, I assume if you guys are watching my channels, I'm assuming you're, you're watch people. I shouldn't say guys, you all, you know, are, are into watches and you don't just buy watches to stick a, on your wrist once a month to go show off at a party that you actually wear them and you enjoy your watches every day as they should be. And part of enjoying your watches and wearing them to the office and wearing them about is they're going to pick up dings and scratches. Um, you know, and it depends on the watch. So on stainless steel watches, you're guaranteed to pick up scratches. It's just the nature of the beast. And it's really not that big of a deal. And they can be polished out. And there's there's ways online. There's all sorts of articles online about how you can polish them out. Um, I am not comfortable doing that on my own at home. I know people use, like... Uh, I forget these things called there's there's different kinds of stuff you can buy um long story short i wouldn't do it at home you can look up youtube videos of people that polish the scratches out of their watches at home i don't trust myself to do it well without damaging my watch um jewelers have polishing equipment as well they can polish scratches out and i mean the reality is if if you get a bunch of scratches on your watch it's really not that big of a deal if it's stainless steel um, the only thing you really need to be concerned about is when you do decide to have them polished out is that you take them to somebody that's very well versed in watch polishing because when you polish anything down you actually end up removing some of the material and if you take it to some idiot that doesn't know what they're doing they could end up polishing down the watch to a point where not only does it lose some of its correct patina but you end up taking away some of the shape of the watch and actually deform the watch from taking away material in key areas on stainless watches, unless the watch is like really, really old and it's been through several polishing cycles, it's really not that big of a deal. But on gold watches, it's actually a big pain. Um, like I had that Rolex President and, you know, some moron polished that watch for me and some of the, like the gold symbols and the gold actually got somewhat polished off because gold, as you probably know, is a very soft metal. And so, you know, the moron that I gave it to end up polishing down some of the, the stampings on the bracelet and it actually hurt the value of the watch a little bit. And of course, he's actually erasing real gold too. So my watch weighed slightly less than gold weight after he was done with it. So those, those are the only real concerns. If you have a stainless watch, don't worry about it. It's normal. They can be polished if it really bothers you that much. And, you know, some vintage watches now, if they have scratches on them, they have character and it's an aesthetic appeal now. There's people that pay money for things like that. So, I mean, teach their own, but I wouldn't worry too much about scratches. That's just kind of my own take. So, <clears throat> I've gone on far enough, and I'm sure at this point you're sick of listening to me. So, those are kind of my takes. Uh, as always, if you liked what you saw here, give me a thumbs up. If you thought it was total crap and a waste of your time, give me a thumbs down and tell me why. Your feedback matters to me. Uh, if you haven't already and you like what you have seen here, please subscribe to my channel. And as always, please give me your feedback. You know, I, I do these videos not only to kind of answer questions, but also to get feedback myself. I like to learn more about the watch industry. There's people out there with experience that I don't have. And if you have any takes on what I've talked about here, I'd love to hear your perspective. And as always, please give me future uh, content. So what comments, questions, and concerns would you like me to address in future blog posts? So as always, thank you for your support, and I hope you're having a good day.